Make It Stick is all about the science of successful learning. Key word being science. Most of us believe that in order to learn something, we should make it as simple as possible for ourselves to do so. After all, if we had a choice between two ways to learn something, one hard, the other easy, wouldn't it make more sense to make use of the easiest way to learn rather than the more difficult and effortful method of learning? Make it stick turns traditional ideas like these on their head. Drawing on recent discoveries in cognitive psychology and other disciplines, the authors offer concrete techniques for becoming more productive learners, perfect for people of all ages and walks of life, from students to moms to Fortune 500 CEOs, the big ideas from Make It Stick can be put to use by all of us interested in strengthening our learning skills and applying them both personally and professionally. Crucial Quotes from Make It Stick Quote, It's not just what you know, but how you practice what you know that determines how well the learning serves you later. End quote. Tweetable Summary Traditional learning styles are flawed, but can be strengthened significantly by practicing proven but counterintuitive strategies regularly. Big idea number one. Intellect isn't inborn. Quote, Many people believe that their intellectual ability is hardwired from birth and that failure to meet a learning challenge is an indictment of their native ability. But every time you learn something new, you change the brain. End quote. It's important to start this summary off by making something very clear. Your intellectual ability is not hardwired from birth. You can literally change and mold and shape your brain. But how? by using specific and effortful learning strategies that most of us were not taught in the classroom. In short, learning to make it stick requires that we put forth effort as we're learning. As Peter Brown says in the book, quote, learning is deeper and more durable when it's effortful. Learning that's easy is like writing in the sand, here today and gone tomorrow. Big idea number two, fluency versus mastery. Quote, pay attention to the cues you're using to judge what you have learned. Whether something feels familiar or fluent is not always a reliable indicator of learning. Neither is your level of ease in retrieving a fact or a phrase on a quiz shortly after encountering it in a lecture or text. Ease of retrieval after a delay, however, is a good indicator of learning. Far better is it to create a mental model of the material that integrates the various ideas across a text, connects them to what you already know, and enables you to draw inferences." End quote. We are poor judges of when we are learning well and when we are not learning well. When the going is harder and slower, it doesn't feel productive. We are drawn to strategies that feel more fruitful, unaware that the gains from these strategies are often temporary. Rereading text and massed practice of a skill or new knowledge are by far the preferred study strategies of learners of all stripes, but they're also among the least productive. By massed practice, we mean the single-minded, rapid-fire repetition of something you're trying to burn into memory. The practice, practice, practice of conventional wisdom. Rereading and massed practice give rise to feelings of fluency that are taken to be signs of mastery. But for true mastery or durability, these strategies are largely a waste of time. Contrary to popular belief, lots of highlighting, rereading, repeatedly doing the same thing over and over and over again for an extended period of time does not 
contribute to stronger learning over the long term. Some of these popular learning strategies, like cramming for an exam, for instance, might give us the illusion of having learned something, but are at best only effective for recalling concepts over a very short period of time. But if it's genuine mastery and durability that you're after, then you'll need something that's less predictable for your brain than constantly rereading the same stuff over and over and over again. In the following big ideas, we'll dive into some ways in which you can develop lasting learning habits that'll really help you make it stick. Big idea number three, to learn, retrieve. Quote, a child stringing cranberries on a thread goes to hang them on the tree, only to find they've slipped off the other end. Without the knot, there's no making a string. Without the knot, there's no necklace, there's no beaded purse, there's no magnificent tapestry. Retrieval ties the knot for memory. Repeated retrieval snugs it up and adds a loop to make it fast. Today, we know from empirical research that practicing retrieval makes learning stick far better than re-exposure to the original material does. This is the testing effect also known as the retrieval practice effect. To be most effective, retrieval must be repeated again and again in spaced out sessions so that the recall, rather than becoming a mindless recitation, requires some cognitive effort. Repeated recall appears to help memory consolidate into a cohesive representation in the brain and to strengthen and multiply the neural roots by which the knowledge can later be retrieved, end quote. Sure, it feels great to go back and reread the material you're trying to learn because it feels like we're actually really getting the ideas in there. And this is helpful to a certain degree but you know what could give your learning far more firepower than rereading? Retrieving. That's what. If you want to maximize your learning potential, start tying more knots, as they say, to ensure that the cranberries don't slip off that string. A wonderful way to do this is to regularly test yourself, to regularly practice retrieving material or concepts or ideas. Here's an actionable insight to help you put this idea into practice. Without reviewing what you've already read so far in this book summary or heard so far in this audiobook summary, what are three ideas or words or concepts that you've learned about so far from Make It Stick? Anything related to this book will do. Just think of three things, phrases, ideas, concepts, whatever, and go ahead and write them down below or somewhere else on a journal or sheet of paper or in your smartphone if you wish. Just jot down three quick things that you've learned so far in this book summary on Make It Stick. You can pause this audiobook if you'd like a few minutes to go ahead and do that. All right, we're back. Big idea number four. Build mastery through testing. Quote, in virtually all areas of learning, you build better mastery when you use testing as a tool to identify and bring up your areas of weakness. End quote. Testing is a powerful form of learning. So, anytime you learn something that matters to you, say you read a book, attend a lecture, watch a tutorial, etc., Practice a little active retrieval by giving yourself a quick little test. Will it feel good? Probably not, but neither does testing your physical fitness with a difficult but doable workout session, and we all know the benefits that arise from doing that. Testing yourself is just like giving your brain a good workout. The more you do it, the more mental muscles you'll build. As Brown tells us, if you want to make it stick, be sure to quiz yourself regularly 
to maximize understanding. One of the best habits, they say in the book, a learner can instill in herself is regular self-quizzing to recalibrate her understanding of what she does and does not know. Big idea number five. Use elaboration and express concepts in your own words. Quote, Elaboration is the process of giving new material meaning by expressing it in your own words and connecting it with what you already know, end quote. So, if we were going to do that with this big idea in particular, it might sound something like this. Elaboration is when we make new concepts more significant and easier to understand by putting them in our own words and connecting them with something we already know and understand. Get it? Now you try. Try elaborating on our previous big idea by putting it in your own words. The big idea, if you remember, was build mastery through testing. And the quote or explanation that it began with and that you want to express in your own words is this, quote, in virtually all areas of learning, you build better mastery when you use testing as a tool to identify and bring up your areas of weakness, end quote. Feel free to go ahead and pause me so that you can go ahead and express that concept in your own words via the concept of elaboration. All right, we're back. Big idea number six, strengthen learning by making it meaningful. Quote, learning is stronger when it matters, when the abstract is made concrete and personal. End quote. Let's say you're having a really hard time attracting the mate of your dreams. Don't you think you'd be more likely to read up on books about relationships or search online for the best ways to find a girlfriend or boyfriend if you were in that situation? Of course, right? But why? Because finding a girlfriend is something that actually matters to you at this point in your life. In other words, it's meaningful. And because it's meaningful, you are more likely to retain the information you learn and put it to use so that you can attract the guy or gal you've been dreaming about. Big idea number seven. Use interleaving to help make it stick over the long run. Quote, when the baseball players at Cal Poly practiced curveball after curveball over 15 pitches, it became easier for them to remember the perceptions and responses they needed for that type of pitch. The look of the ball's spin, how the ball changed direction, how fast its direction changed, and how long to wait for it to curve. Performance improved but the growing ease of recalling those perceptions and responses led to little durable learning. It is one skill to hit a curveball when you know a curveball will be thrown. It is a different skill to hit a curveball when you don't know it's coming. End quote. What the authors are explaining in the aforementioned quote is that if the baseball players want to optimize their skills and become better athletes, they need to spend less of their time practicing hitting curveballs when they know they're coming and spend most of their time practicing hitting the curveballs when they don't know they're coming. Unfortunately, however, the players often do the reverse, spending countless back-to-back -back hours of hitting curveball after curveball with no surprises thrown into the mix to switch it up and keep them on their toes. This way of practicing, of doing the same thing over and over again, is a form of massed practice, which builds performance gains on short-term memory. Eventually, the authors split up the Cal Poly batters into two groups to do a test. Group 1, the massed practice group, hit curveball after curveball. Group 2, the interleaved practice group, was thrown random pitches. 
Which group do you think became better batters overall? As you've probably already gathered at this point, the answer is group two. The ones who started practicing with random pitches, a.k.a. interleaved practice, which was more challenging and slowed their performance gains down significantly, but came along with the following upside. When they finally started building up their skills and got good enough to hit randomly pitched balls effectively, curveballs, straight throws, etc., etc., they retained these skills over the long run, making them better, sharper batters as a result. Now, even though Group 1, who hit curveball after curveball, felt and looked like they were getting better, their gains actually did not last because they were only based on short-term memory. You see, that's the difference between massed practice doing the same thing over and over again, versus interleaved practice, switching things up, randomizing your practice. Mast practice, again, is doing the same thing over and over again. It feels good and leaves us with a perceived level of mastery. Not necessarily good. Interleaved practice, mixing things up, randomizing our learning practice, puts us on a path to true and lasting mastery. A great example of interleaved practice might be randomly shuffling your flashcards every time you quiz yourself in preparation for an exam. Doing this switches things up for you and prevents you from memorizing the order of the answers since your brain won't know which question or flashcard will pop up next. Bottom line, when you're learning something new or trying to build up your skills at something, whether that something is sports-related, school-related, work-related, or anything else, be sure to make it a little bit more difficult than you're used to in order to get the best long-term learning results. Big idea number eight. Spaced practice versus massed practice. Quote, spaced practice, which allows some forgetting to occur between sessions, strengthens both the learning and the cues and routes for fast retrieval when that learning is needed again. As when the pitcher tries to surprise the batter with a curveball after pitching several fastballs, the more effort that is required to recall a memory or to execute a skill, provided that the effort succeeds, the more the act of recalling or executing benefits the learning. Mast practice gives us the warm sensation of mastery because we are looping information through short-term memory without having to reconstruct the learning from long-term memory. But just as with rereading as a study strategy, the fluency gained through massed practice is transitory and our sense of mastery is illusory. It's the effortful process of reconstructing the knowledge that triggers reconsolidation and deeper learning. End quote. Here's a common example of how to put spaced practice to work in the real world. Let's say you want to remember the name of someone you've literally just met. Within a few seconds of beginning the conversation, Go ahead and be sure to repeat their name back to them. For instance, it's a pleasure to meet you, Sherry. A couple of minutes into the conversation, look for an excuse to say their name again or repeat it back in your head. Let's say your buddy randomly strolls into the conversation. You might say, Sherry, meet my friend Jeff. This helps you retain Sherry's name for several more minutes taking you to the end of your conversation. When you say your goodbyes, say Sherry's name one more time. And once you do that, you've likely locked it in to your memory for about another day or so. And if you run into Sherry again the day after that and recall her name as you see her approaching you, you'll remember her name for about another week or so. So that's spaced practicing at work. 
Here's basically how it works in a nutshell. You learn something, recall it again after five seconds, recall it again after 25 seconds, recall it again at two minutes, then 10 minutes, then an hour, five hours, one day, five days, 25 days, four months, two years, and so on. You space out, basically, the timing in which you try to recall that thing you learned from your memory. And if you can do that, then you're more likely to retain that information. Big idea number nine, regularly reflect, retrieve, and reanalyze. Quote, reflection can involve several cognitive activities that lead to stronger learning. Retrieving knowledge and earlier training from memory, connecting these to new experiences, and visualizing and mentally rehearsing what you might do differently next time. End quote. Reflecting on ideas you've learned regularly can really power up and strengthen your understanding of a concept. Let's dive into an actionable insight to really get this idea in there for you. Try thinking about whether an idea you've just learned makes sense to you. Next, ask yourself this. How could I apply this to my own life? Perhaps think about what you already know that you could connect this idea to. Now, visualize yourself actually applying that idea in your own mind's eye. Big idea number 10. Increase your abilities by tapping into the power of belief. Quote, Let's return to the old saw, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It turns out there is more truth here than wit. Attitude counts for a lot. The studies of the psychologist Carol Dweck have gotten huge attention for showing just how big an impact one simple conviction can have on learning and performance. The belief that your level of intellectual ability is not fixed, but rests to a large degree in your own hands. Study skills and learning skills are inert until they're powered by an active ingredient, Dweck says. That active ingredient is the simple but nonetheless profound realization that the power to increase your abilities lies largely within your own control. Carol Dweck is the author of an excellent book called Mindset, in which she tells us that it's not just our abilities and talent that bring us success, but whether we approach them with a fixed or a growth mindset. In the book, Dweck teaches us about the difference between those two mindsets and how we can utilize the proper, that is, growth mindset to approach and achieve our personal and professional goals in life. If you want more about mindset, you can check out the book summary over at getflashnotes.com mindset. So as we apply Dweck's research and ideas within the context of learning, it's worth noting her insights on why some people become helpless when they encounter challenges and fail at them, whereas when others respond to failure by redoubling their efforts and trying new strategies to help them achieve a successful outcome. As the authors of Make It Stick tell us, Dweck's research insights uncovered something really interesting about these two sets of people and how they respond to failure. Quote, a fundamental difference between the two responses lies in how a person attributes their failure. Those who attribute failure to their own inability, that is, I'm not intelligent, become helpless. And on the other end of the spectrum, those who interpret failure as the result of insufficient effort or part of an ineffective strategy, dig deeper and try different approaches, end quote. The key takeaway then is this. 
do you actually believe you can grow your skill set, your knowledge, your abilities, your relationships, or whatever else you need in order to develop to get what you want out of life? Because believing really is the first step towards achieving. And that's more than just a cute saying. It's backed by science. So as we close out this book summary, it might be worth your while to ask yourself if you're doing everything you can to grow yourself to the person you desire and deserve to be. And if not, why? Why not work harder when you fail rather than giving up and getting down? Why not develop your skills and try again next time? Why not read a little more, study a little harder, and try again and again until you do succeed? It's all under your control. You get to decide whether you make mistakes or whether you let mistakes make you. We all make them from time to time. But that doesn't mean we can't go back out there and learn more and practice more until we can get ourselves to finally meet with success and make it stick. Thank you. For-